Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Empowerment with Elizabeth. Today I am here with my sweet new friend, uh, Katie Harmon, who was Miss America. And she's going to talk to us a little bit about her year and her experience with the Miss America organization. So Katie, tell us a little bit about yourself. So nice to meet you, Elizabeth. Thank you. I was Miss America 2002. I was crowned in 2001, right in the wake of 9-11. In the 22 years since, I've been a professional performer on a variety of stages around the world, um, doing everything from opera to musical theater to jazz and various recording projects in between. <laughs> and as a as an, a hilarious juxtaposition to that, I live in rural Southern Oregon. And for about 10 years, I uh, had a farm with my husband and our children. I have two children, a uh, an 18 year old freshman in college, uh, which I can't even believe I'm saying that, and a 15 year old who's a freshman in high school. I met my husband when I was Miss America, which is a fun story. Elizabeth, we could dig into that, but I met him while I was Miss America and he uh, is recently retired from the Air Force, Lieutenant Colonel Tim Ebner. Um, and we have enjoyed living in our beautiful small community because of our Air Force connections. And I have been very involved with our local community. I still do breast cancer advocacy work, um, but I've also expanded to arts advocacy and more recently to um, women's health advocacy. And I uh, started the Virtuosa Society. I founded the Virtuosa Society last year as a resource for female creatives. I love it. I love it. So talk to us. Let's go back to kind of the beginning. So talk to us about how you got started in pageantry. I got started in pageantry my freshman year of college. And I, like many, many young women pursuing higher education, did not have enough funds uh, to fund my dreams. Uh, but I knew that I wanted to go to college. I knew that I wanted to to get a bachelor's degree and I wanted to get a master's degree. And I eventually had the, the goal of getting my doctorate as well. So I knew that that was going to take some money. I worked very hard throughout high school to, um, to get the kinds of grades and to be involved in the kinds of things that would help me uh, attain as many scholarships as possible. And by the grace of God, I was able to finance my entire freshman year of college at a private liberal arts university uh, in Tacoma, Washington, the University of Puget Sound, which was about $42,000 a year at that time. This is 23 years ago, by the way. So, or more than that, even 1999 was when I was a freshman in, in college. So imagine the inflation and, and how much it costs now. I think it's probably upwards of, of, 50 plus 60 thousands now. So I was able to have to receive or, or acquire enough scholarships to cover that first year. But midway through that year, as I'm projecting the following years, um, I knew that I wasn't going to have enough money to, to call to, to finance the rest of my education and beyond, you know, we're talking all of higher ed mm -hmm. uh, for me specifically. And I, I was pretty discouraged. I went home that Christmas break, my freshman year of college, told this to my parents who had very early on in my high school education expressed to me that they also could not afford to pay for my education. So it would be entirely on me. I knew that, but I was telling them about this and expressing and um, they said, well, honey, you know, maybe you need to, you need to think out of the box a little bit. Think beyond the scholarships that are right in front of your face and and just uh, keep praying about it. So I went to the grocery store as, as one does when they're discouraged, went to the grocery store yeah. and I have to run into my former drama director from high school. And she was asking me how college was going. And of course, because it was top of mind, I started to tell her about my concerns about being able to pop, to pay for these requisite years of, of higher ed. And she then proceeded to tell me something that I had never known about her. Uh, she was second runner up to Miss Oregon when she was going through college. These were in the early years of the Miss Oregon pageant as well. Never knew this. 
you know, when it's your high school teacher, these things don't often just come up. Fair. So it was, I was delighted and thrilled that, that she would reveal this new information to me. And she said, yeah, both my sister and I competed. Her sister was first runner up and she was second runner up and they earned just enough money for her to pay for the books and a little bit of her tuition at Western Oregon State College for her to become a teacher. And she therefore had followed the evolution of the pageant all these years later and truly wholeheartedly believed in the pageant because she herself had been a participant. But in following the evolution of the pageant, she knew that it would be a good fit for me. And she said, Katie, have you ever thought about entering the Miss Oregon program? And of course, no, it had not at all. It wasn't even in on, on the spectrum of things that I would have ever considered. But I'm so grateful because had it not been for her insight and, and the fact that she knew me really well from having been you know, my teacher for four straight years in high school, she knew that I would be a good candidate for this. And she was absolutely right. I, I, I wasn't immediately sold though, Elizabeth, I'll tell you that I did go home. I told my mom, you know, I can't believe this. I ran into Mrs. Mauser at the grocery and she told me that I should enter the Miss Oregon program. And my mom kind of did one of these. She was like, Oh, wow. And that was the out of the box thing that they were hoping that I would find. So my parents were wildly supportive, but it was on me then to research it. So I went back to university for the next semester and clacked on the computer to find out more information about Miss America. And uh, Heather French was Miss America at that time. And I could see in the references to the young women who were participating in the program at that time, I could see myself in these women. Mm -hmm. These were like-minded type A go-getters um, who also had um, an interest in, in social causes, but also were very involved in some sort of artistic pursuit with talent. And I mean, I just, I, I absolutely felt at home with the program. And so I did, I put my name uh, in the in the hat for the Miss Oregon Scholarship Program. I trained with them for a little bit. Um, this was, I, well, let's see here. Oh, Elizabeth, it's been a long time. <laughs> I entered the Miss Multnomah County Scholarship Program, which awarded three crowns. So it was a multi-crown pageant. And I won uh, after what, two months or so of rehearsal, driving back and forth from Tacoma to Portland, each weekend over the spring, two or so months, right? Um, I won that first, that title of Miss Multnomah County, was first runner up at Miss Oregon that first year, went to the Sweetheart Pageant as first runner up. Yes, 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 yes. Had an incredible experience at the Sweetheart Pageant, highly recommend it. Um, was so jazzed from that that I went back competed uh, for Miss Portland, won Miss Portland, Miss Oregon, and then Miss America. So it was a quick, about a year and a half, all told, of participation. I'm so jealous that you got to do Sweetheart. I have heard nothing but exactly what you just said. Like, it was the best week ever. Like, they're so amazing. Just, I mean, people that I know that have been just rave and rave and rave about it. So that's so fun that you got really? to do that, too. Well, they were amazing. It was also, I had been told, this is the closest thing that you're going to get to Miss America without being at Miss America. And for a first timer, everything was new to me. So I didn't know what to expect. And I, I do feel like going into situations without expectation uh, brings the most joy <laughs> mm -hmm. because then you're open. You're open to receiving whatever this, the situation is going to bring. Mm -hmm. And in that instance, I met some of my dearest girlfriends. Uh, and also had this fire kind of lit under me for for competition. It gave it renewed my excitement for being part of the program because I was meeting new people beyond my circle of of Miss Oregon mm -hmm. friends too. And it also proved to me the that the the model for what the Miss America organization was going for works. 
Mm -hmm. works across the U.S., across these different cultural and and boundary lines of our uh, respective demographics, even. Mm -hmm. So uh, where we live, geographics, I should say. But for a small town girl from Oregon, I mean, it was it was terrific. I was top 10 and I was relieved that I did not win. Isn't that hilarious? I mean, I, looking back, I, I can see why I was just exhausted. I was trying to take it all in and everything was so new, but I was, I was so thrilled that I didn't win. Yeah. But our winner did end up becoming Miss Mississippi a couple of years after that. And, and Mackenzie Mays was her name. Yeah. And, yeah. That's and Mackenzie was the perfect sweetheart winner. I mean, I was, we were so thrilled. She was wonderful. So it was a great experience. I love the sweetheart people, the, the city of Hoopston, mm-hmm. um, the national sweetheart team uh, led by the Crabtree family is just, oh, these are salt of the earth people with the biggest hearts you could ever imagine. I mean, they are the foundation for what it means to be a volunteer in this program. It's just really, they're very special. It was a great experience. That's what I've heard. It's on my bucket list to go. (laughs) So I'm jealous. (laughs) Um, But talk to us about, you know, your talent. You said that you've worked, you know, in the arts for some time now. So talk to us about what your talent is. Yeah. So I have been a vocalist for, oh gosh, 30 plus years now. I began voice lessons at the age of 11. And when I began, it was, it was like, uh, it's love at first sight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when I began voice lessons, I had been in uh, ballet for years before that. But when um, when I came to the place of classical music specifically, mm-hmm. I felt like I had, had that missing piece that was kind of put within me. And as a child, when you find that piece that you feel uh, kind of completes you or is something that you really, really love, um, it's a great time to pour into it. And, and I was lucky enough to have a fantastic private vocal instructor, as well as a really good arts program at my high school that helped to feed this, um, this already existing need and talent that I already had. Mm-hmm. So I was really lucky in that regard. And I was able to pour into uh, my arts education, thanks to that for all of those years of, of my, you know, the remainder of my elementary through middle through high school, which then led me into um, pursuing it in college. And because I identified, or I should say, I should back up here because my private voice instructor identified very early on in my voice or early on in my lessons that my voice was, um, had the right color and my embouchure and the way that I was producing sound um, fit very well for classical music. They identified that very on, she identified that very early on. Um, That was what I pursued most heavily in college. But what was interesting was that I had also been doing musical theater during that time. So I knew how to do both Mm -hmm. and I loved both equally. So when it came time to choose my talent for Miss America, there was a conversation about what exactly I was going to present. Um, Granted, when I say choose my talent for Miss America, we're talking choose my talent all the way back at the local level. (laughs) So what I'm saying at the local level was what I sang at at Miss Oregon and, and then what I took to Miss America. So it was not, I didn't wait until the last minute for that choice. But I, I, at that time, I was a, a sophomore in college when I was pursuing that second year in the Miss Oregon program. And so I already was within the opera program at Portland State University because after my freshman year uh, and after winning first runner up, I had just enough funds to be able to fund a, a state college, an in-state college, as opposed to the out-of-state private liberal arts college. So I did transfer in order to save money. Thank you. Thank Smart. goodness. You know, that was, yeah, you, know, you do what you do, what you have to do. So at Portland State University, though, it was kismet because I met my now longtime uh, voice teacher that I've had as an adult. Um, so I've been very lucky to have a handful of just 
wonderful voice teachers that I've stuck with for a long time. But I met um, Ruth at that time and studied under her and the PSU Opera Program, which was a, um, a component of Portland Opera's apprenticeship program, which was very cool. And Ruth suggested that um, I take part in a competition that was part of Oregon Symphony and an organization in Portland called Metro Arts. Hmm. And it was a concerto competition. And it identified various young people in the arts in Portland um, who were exceptional for lack of better words. <laughs> so this competition, I applied for this competition. And when I won this concerto competition, the conductor that I was working with for the performance for the, the competition suggested O mio baby no caro from Puccini's Gianni Schicchi. And so I was preparing with my college voice teacher, O mio babino, for something completely separate than pageants. Mind <laughs> you, I already had this year of pageants uh, of Miss Oregon, I should say, not pageants, just one, <laughs> or what was it at that point? Three total pageants <laughs> under my belt. But I already had that knowledge. And that first year I performed um, A Je Veux Vivre from Gounod's Romeo and Juliet, as well as Artist Calling from Me, a, a Victor uh, Herbert art song. So those are that's what I had performed up to that point. And I was preparing to do the same thing the next year. But because I was doing this other piece, for something aside from pageants, I was working on it in in a in such a way that it was to be uh, at a professional level. That it was to be performed at a professional level. When my voice teacher asked about what I was going to perform then at the pageant, um, she was genius. She brought up. She said, "You've already been preparing this." you as well this, yeah for this professional performance why not do this and oh by the way that's when they had changed well no we were still two minutes they had changed it from two and a half minutes or three minutes i think it was the standing uh length of time for your talent presentation and then somewhere in the 90s like late 90s they changed it to um two minutes which now it's only a minute and a half right oh, sweat every single time i watch the talents i think how are they doing this in such a short amount of time but for two minutes is exactly two minutes in length so it was really divine it was meant to be that i had already been preparing it in this way and had poured into it and therefore really understood the aria and could sing it practically in my sleep but then it also fit the requirements for the pageant. So that's how we came about choosing Omeo Babi No Prado. And uh, it helps that I absolutely love the aria. And, and of course, it's it's a fantastic pageant aria. Absolutely. And it was sung at Miss America this year. I think it was DC that did it. I just did a podcast with her. And she was like, I love this oh. song. It's my favorite. And so it well, and it makes it sense to something, something that I really identified with. And I think that young women can identify with about the character is that Loretta, who is the character that sings it in the mm -hmm. opera. And it's a, it's a tiny one act opera, by the way. So it's, it's not the, the aria takes place at kind of an apex during this one act opera, which is so cool too. But in the opera, she is begging her father to let her marry her boyfriend. And she says in so much as, oh, daddy, he's so pretty. He's so pretty. Won't you let me marry him? Oh, daddy, please. Oh, daddy, please. And if you don't let me marry him, I'm going to throw myself off of the old bridge, the Ponte Vecchio. As you do. <laughs> into the Arno River in Florence. Oh, God, I want to die. Because in the middle of the song in the actual opera, Janice Geeky says, no, no, no. And of course you don't hear that in a solo, but it's so fun, that interplay. So in my mind, while I'm singing it on the Miss America stage, I'm hearing no, 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 which then propels the emotion. So it makes it so fun. And then at the end, she says, oh, daddy, have pity, have pity. Now I'm one of three girls in my family. I have an older half sister and a younger sister. 
And my dad, I, I distinctly remember these conversations with my dad about boyfriends. Oh, daddy, he's so cute. <laughs> Let me date him. And then later on, oh, daddy, this guy, this, this fighter pilot, he's so cute. I want to marry him. I mean, I obviously these are relatable human things that we're talking about in this aria. So it made it that much more easy to sing it authentically. And I think why people are really connected to that aria and especially why it does so well on the pageant, in the pageant circuit and on the Miss America stage. And you mentioned just now, but also whenever in your intro that you met your husband during your year as Miss America. So I am on the edge of my seat. I have to hear the story. Oh my goodness, it's such a fun story. So this is more than three fourths of the way through my Miss America year. And I mentioned that I was crowned right in the wake of 9-11. And many of my appearances were USO based, mm -hmm. uh, military based and rescue worker based mm -hmm. because of that time period. I was also doing, so it was kind of like a, a dual platform issue. I had a mm -hmm. dual platform mission in essence because I was also doing work on behalf of the breast cancer community which I loved that advocacy work so doing both of those at the same time made my year incredibly rich mm -hmm. it was diverse and it was very rich but up to that point three-fourths of the way through my year I had been doing military appearances very regularly so I had the system down of who I was going to meet and that there were lots of cute boys around and <laughs> none of them turned my eye that was not I was not looking for a boyfriend, Elizabeth. I was not definitely not looking for a husband. You're a little busy. <laughs> I, was, I was there to do the job. There was enough. I just wanted to get take a nap. Like mm -hmm. that was my goal during my downtime, not to date. There. <laughs> yeah. And it's such a big job. Mm -hmm. There's so much that you're pouring into it on a minute by minute basis. Mm -hmm. And when I'm, when I was at appearances and to this day, I'm very focused on the task at hand. Mm -hmm. So in, in this particular instance, this appearance happened to be at my hometown base at, at the Portland Air Guard base in Portland, Oregon. And I had done some work on behalf of the National Guard that year uh, through the USO. So I was asked to make this appearance on behalf of the National Guard at my hometown base because they felt like that connection was very important. And it was, absolutely. Um, the Portland Air Guard base fl flies to this day F-15 Eagles, fighter jets that are air-to-air -air, uh, warfare machines, essentially, these fighter jets. And their task post 9-11 was um, capping over the major cities in the West Coast and, and the Hawaiian Islands uh, for protection. So if you can imagine back to that, that time period, you know, there was a lot of surveillance happening and the military had to, had to expand its reach mm -hmm. in that way. So it was really interesting that it was also that we had this base in my hometown, essentially. So I make this, I'm asked to make this appearance and uh, unbeknownst to me, this is the side story, Elizabeth. This young man, this young pilot, um, who was from the, the rural town that we are living in now. <laughs> he grew up here in Klamath Falls where we live, um, but he was stationed in Portland as an F-15 pilot to be one of the alert pilots is what they call them. And he was the only single pilot and the youngest pilot, second Lieutenant Tim Edner. Um, which is the exact same rank as our current Miss America, by the way. So very cool fact. <laughs> I love that. When they said second Lieutenant Marsh, I was like, oh, God, I know one of those. So. <laughs> yeah, I have one of those. <laughs> well, she, or anyhow, he was this kind of newly, newly minted guy. And he was also, he's also very good looking. I'm not ashamed to say it. And so he had been doing a lot of their, their uh, press and media appearances as well. He had been appearing on camera. So they assigned him Miss America detail as the pilot who was going to help show me around the base during this particular appearance because of what I just mentioned. And we show up, of course, to me and my traveling companion. I will say when I say we, I was always with a traveling companion. 
Uh, my traveling companion and I show up to this appearance and we are met by a throng of, of reporters because hometown, they, they're already familiar with their, with Oregon's Miss America. So reporters are there. The base had their people around as well. And uh, I am met in the uh, ops room, which is basically the operational management uh, quarters of where the base, what the base has for uh, its wing operations. And um, I'm standing there and up walks uh, Second Lieutenant Tim Ebner to me to shake my hand and to formally introduce himself. And uh, lo and behold, there was something that just went off in my traveling companion's mind at that time, because when she took one look at him, and mind you, she's been with me at all these appearances too. Something goes off in her mind and she's like, oh, this guy is different. He's special. He's not only cute, but woo, there's just something about him. Typically she would hang back at appearances and just kind of observe and make sure I was safe, all of those things. So I shake his hand. I am then, you know, kind of talking and mingling with other people and she zips right in and she introduces herself. So that's uh, clue number one, that something was different about this particular appearance <laughs> in this guy. So he is with us throughout the entire appearance and there's a lot to this. They outfit me in a flight suit. Um, I make this special PSA uh, in the cockpit of an F-15. We have these glorious photos of him showing, kind of perched on the outside of the jet and showing me the interior and all of the electronics and things. And I've got my crown on and I sent that to Madison. I was like, Madison, now you're going to be a legit pilot, Miss America, with the crown on in the cockpit. <laughs> I never got to fly the aircraft, but you will get to. But we've got these glorious photos. And of course, we've got it all on camera, which is so fun to have that on film. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the appearance, fast forward, at the end of the appearance, um, I'm with the wing commander at one end of the runway watching the F-15s take off. And Tim and my traveling companion, Joanne, are at the other. And she takes the opportunity to pull out her business card and write my email address on the back of it. <laughs> And she says in her New Jersey accent, there are no rules against Miss America dating. And she tucks that like in his palm. He thought, oh, this woman is, is nuts. Um, but we still have that card to this day. We got it framed with the whole thing. Joanne knew she just had a sixth sense and she was like a mother to me. So she knew me well and she, she had some good vibes from this guy. Um, fast forward, Elizabeth, a month later, he, through friends of friends, because this is Portland after all, this is where I'm from, um, got my phone number, found out when I was going to be back in town because it had been implanted in his brain. Oh, maybe there is something about this girl. Um, he told me years later that there was, like he was connected to me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's kind of funny to think about all of that, but it, he found my phone number, found out when I was going to be back in town, called me. Um, I had delivered the commencement address at my university at Portland State University the day before. I had one day off before I was going to fly to Minot, North Dakota for the next day's appearance. I had one night off, Elizabeth. Remind, remember what I said before? All I wanted was to take a nap. There. <laughs> he called, um, uh, at that time it was Miss Harmon. Um, I would like to take you out on a date. Uh, and I, I actually asked him, what is, who is this again? And he says, Second Lieutenant Tim Ebner, I showed you around the base a month ago. And I just wanted to thank you for coming and being with us. And I would like to take you out for dinner. And I actually called after that. I said, well, let me call you back and, and um, let me find out my schedule. And I called Kim Grice, who is Miss Kansas my year. And I told her about it. And she said, well, if the date goes badly, um, call me and I will pose as your traveling companion and get you out of the date. <laughs> Run right there. <laughs> I called him back and I said, okay, I'll go on this date. Um, the Miss America office was alerted to it. They knew what was happening. There was a whole rigmarole around it, which is great. You know, you can't just go out on a date as Miss sure. America. There was sure. a whole system. So we got on this date and of course it was the best date I had ever been on. And I never called Miss Kansas and she knew from that point forward, oh, this is the one. This is it. 
So we phone dated the rest of that year, you know, the, the last fourth of my year as Miss America. And uh, that's all she wrote. I love, it was it. One. I love it. And what a special memory to have too. Like you said, you still have the little card. That's so fun. And I love that you guys have it framed too, as you it's should. It's so fun. Well, and we choose each other every day. So marriage is hard work. We have these two children. We've raised these two children. Uh, it's it's a challenge in and of itself to be a service member and then to be a military spouse. And I certainly give him credit for being married to a Miss America. But it's, you know, we choose each other every day. So we're so grateful that in my Miss America story, um, I can say that that I also met someone that I, I get to spend the rest of my life with. So that was a perk. That wasn't an, that wasn't expected in the job. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But it was a wonderful perk. No kidding, no kidding. Well, thank you so much, Katie, for coming on. You're so sweet to come on and, um, you know, take time from your kids and your sweet husband to come chat with us on the podcast. So thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yay, and I will see the rest of you guys on our next episode. Bye, y'all.